Good afternoon. I'm going to start with a simple fact about Andy. He's a twidiot. Um, this is a definition given to him by his wife, apparently, and it relates to his complete avoidance of the world of Twitter, Instagram, in Pinterest, and a few other things out there, and anything to do with social media, or at least in relation to his work. Andy has a deep background in and a passion for geography, urban planning, and communication. So I don't think he avoids the internet because he doesn't understand the medium, but more likely because he doesn't trust uh, it with the facts and the data that he holds dear. Facts, it seems today, and especially in our world, are a very brittle shield. I picture Andy a bit like the researchers who just this last week presented humanity with an image of the M87 black hole. These guys, and women actually led by a woman, took terabytes of data gathered from around the planet, spent years analyzing it, and for the first time in the existence of our entire species, showed us a picture of something we can barely even imagine. That's kind of what Andy does. The picture Andy paints, however, for us, also, also gathered from reams of data and years of experience, doesn't swallow whole galaxies, but it can swallow small companies, and it most definitely charts the course in one way or another for every one of us in this room. Andy's work shows us where we are coming from, where we are going to, as an industry, a region, and a civilization. If you're lucky enough to have attended a public hearing, you will understand that facts alone don't win arguments. And more often than not, on their own, they actually lose them. A few of us have experienced that. We live in a culture where observable truths and science are all challenged by emotion, misinformation, and cognitive dissonance. All of these often amplified by social media. However, as with the axiom that no battle can be won without a strategy, it's also true that no business case, nor political argument, nor grueling public hearing can be won without at least some solid facts backing it up. Andy's mission is to arm us with those facts. And he is both passionate and extremely good at this. As a, an example that I found, just as an engineering geek myself, really interesting, some years ago, Andy took on a project for the federal government uh, on population projection. And uh, 15 years later, sometime in the last few years, that estimate of that work proved to be within 1% uh, level of accuracy. I would give several right teeth if I could have a pro forma end up in 1% accuracy <laughs> within a year. So that's, that's an impressive statistic for something that has such a long-term range. As an industry, we are fighting battles on multiple fronts all the time. History, facts, demographics, and trends are part of the arsenal that Andy's work provides to us. And it's our responsibility to learn and to use these tools constructively and to spread the word. So today, when Andy presents something that resonates with you, take it back to your tribe at the office, your construction site, your family dinner, your social gathering, or a really boring family wedding, or just throw it out onto the Twitterverse and see what conversation it generates. Andy won't do this, so if you fudge the numbers a bit, he won't notice. Um, but by doing so, we can help move his research and our conversation out into the broader world, furthering our cause and our arguments. To do that, by the way, the hashtag for this event and all UDI luncheons is UDIBC. Today, Andy will, as always, wow us, wow us with facts and figures that engender wonder, clarity, and conversation. So, on behalf of our gang at RISE, it is my pleasure to introduce a key member of the Rennie team, and one of our industry's leading statistical warriors, Mr. Andy Ramo. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I think that was the best intro I've ever had. Oh my God. That was awesome. Thanks, Chris. Whew. It's like the bar was not set high enough, and Chris just upped it one. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, Holy crap, 700 people. Thank you, sold out crowd. Uh, you humble me with your presence here. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great to see everybody out. Um, I know there's a lot of questions going on around out there with regard to state of the market as well. And my objective today is to answer at least one question for everybody in the audience. I'm a realist. I know that's not going to happen. So, OK. Uh, so. 
Instead of that, I hope to answer a question for everybody, but if I don't, we've got some stuff for you guys to take away. So on your desk, or sorry, on your tables, you all have a copy of the Rennie Landscape, okay? So the Rennie Landscape is basically a landscape of economic and demographic factors that we consider in, uh, in our day-to-day, -day, and we thought that we would package it up and, uh, and provide it to you guys as well. Um, big thanks to Ryan Berlin, our senior economist, uh, the Intel team, as well as uh, Rennie Marketing team for putting it together uh, and getting it out for us today uh, so that you could all have it on your desks. Um, in the back of this, what we've done is we've put a little cheat sheet for you guys. That's six things that we're watching, that we're keeping our eyes on. So if you can't pack that whole thing around, you can pull the back out and uh, take that with you to your most important meetings as it'll give you the, uh, uh, the sort of the synopsis or the high level of, uh, of what we're looking at. You're also going to get a digital copy of the landscape, which will land in your inboxes sometime early next week. So if you're part of the younger generation who uh, err to the digital side of things, leave these on your, uh, on your tables, and we'll make sure that they get recycled to the bifocal generation who still buy newspapers. I got lots of bad jokes. You guys can laugh. It's OK. It's good. But I also have a long list of all the stuff that I have to go through, so pardon me on that. Um, You'll also get a, a version of or a copy of my presentation as well. So please don't feel the need to scribble the numbers down. If anybody's ever seen me speak before, I think today I only have about 130 slides to get through. It was 168 last year, so I slimmed it down for you guys. Um, and then you'll also get a link to our Renny Intel, so intelligence.renny.com, our Intel landing page. Special thanks to the guys at Renny Digital uh, and Daryl, at uh, part of the digital crew, who have, have put our landing page together. Um, I'm really looking forward to working a lot more with Daryl to uh, expand the range of stuff that uh, um, that we're pr providing with you guys, providing to you guys on the site. You guys also have a registration card uh, as part of that package as well. So if you like, you can actually sign up. You leave us with your name and uh, contact info. We'll leave these on your desks, and the branding team will pick them up at the end of the day. And what we thought we would do to make it a little bit easier for you guys is a landscape of stuff that we actually provide. You can check the boxes off in terms of uh, some of the, the ongoing and recurring publications. This one, will the, the, the landscape will be quarterly, so we will be producing that quarterly. Uh, you can check off what elements you may be interested in as part of that and as I said leave the registration cards on the table and uh, we'll pick them up after and make sure you get onto the list as we get stuff uh, out to the the general public all right so uh, 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 oh you know what I actually have to apologize I knew I was gonna do this I just started talking and what I was supposed to do was to turn my clicker on and I was supposed to show you guys what the any landscape looks like apologies Peter he's gonna kill me so there you go, okay? This is what I was supposed to show you on the first two slides as I was explaining what the landscape was all about. But you know what it's like. Standing up in front of 700 people, it's not easy. Okay, so that is the landscape and some of the other stuff. Title for today. Um, before I get there, uh, I, I made a promise to the guys at the office that I wouldn't do two things. I wouldn't swear and I wouldn't tell bad jokes. So I already said crap, so why don't I tell a joke, okay? More like a little bit of a joke wrapped up into a story. So this is a good one, though. I, this is, warms my heart. So when we had snow a couple months ago, my daughter came home. She's seven. And uh, she came running in after school and says, Papa, 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 I heard a great joke today. And I was like, OK, I bit. So sweetheart, what was the joke that you heard today? She said, OK, OK, OK. What do, what's the difference between snowmen and snow women? And I went, oh, OK. Fish on, I got to ask, okay, sweetheart, what is the difference between snowmen and snow women? And she threw her arms up in the air, in the air and said, snowballs! <laughs> and I went, do you understand the joke, sweetheart? <laughs> and she shrugged her shoulders and went, no. And she turned around and walked away. And at that point, I just about lost my snowballs because I was laughing so hard. So. Okay, joke, done, out of the way. Okay, I'm going on to the second page. 
Where we landed with regard to the title this year, looking beyond the headlines and charting our way forward. As Chris alluded to, there is certainly a lot of headlines out there. Uh, this notion of fake news uh, and you know how much truth do you put into those headlines? How much digging has gone down to actually produce them? So this is uh, what we titled for uh, for today, and, and it is getting beyond those headlines and the data that we use to get beyond those headlines that we use to chart our way forward uh, and provide some of the advice and advisory services that we do for uh, for our clients. So in terms of a roadmap for today, what am I going to talk about? This is a bit of an interesting story as well. The guys at the office have been really, really good at making me get out from behind my computer and go to events like this, go to lunches and lots of public talks. And I was really, really heartened by what I've heard over the last year, just in terms of the level of conversations within a lot of these groups. And it's not just this industry group, but a lot of the other industry groups that, that, I, that I'm involved with. We heard a lot about migration patterns and, and immigration. And on the housing side, not, it's not just about affordability. It's about availability. Uh, the bank of mom and dad I heard come back to me as well because that was some of our initial statistics with Bob and I years and years ago. We also heard a lot of other interesting fun stuff like some stuff about physics and the periodic table and aliens if you can imagine that one. But uh, nonetheless. So it was really neat to hear all that stuff. And then I came around a couple months ago and started thinking about what I was going to talk about for today. And I got a little bit freaked out because that was a lot of the stuff that I had presented to you guys last year and the year before when I was up in front of you as well. And I kind of went, oh my God, what am I going to talk about? And the more I thought about it, what I was hearing was a lot about the what. Immigration. We have more immigrants coming. What I wasn't hearing a lot about was the why. Why are we seeing more immigrants? And what are the implications? Why does it matter to this particular industry? So that's what I'd like to unpack for you guys today is a little bit more on the why side of things. Uh, I'm going to talk about some economics and, and some politics. Uh, the economic side is drawn from the Rennie landscape, which you guys have on, uh, on your desk. Uh, I'm going to talk some demographics, demand, and supply. Uh, this is based on the Rennie Outlook, which you can sign up for as well, which is our annual publication of people, homes, uh, both on the supply and the demand side. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the squeezed generation. That's the generation who's coming into the housing market uh, currently right now. Um, I'm not going to say it's just the millennial generation because it, it is a little bit broader than that, but uh, nonetheless. What I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about the current state of the market. I'm not going to talk about the fact that we saw the lowest amount of sales uh, for March in, back to 1986, or that the sales to listings ratio is now in balanced territory, or that if you look at the benchmarks for the two board areas, it uh, was actually up a little bit. But if you look at the Greater Vancouver board, it was down and the valley was up. If you want any of that stuff, you can actually sign up for the Rennie Review. And that's our monthly statistical publication of all of the MLS stats. Uh, we provide a little bit of a commentary with regard to that as well. So you can check that one off. Um, so that's my roadmap for today. But before I get into that formal stuff, what I thought we would do was we're going to bust some myths. We're going to have some fun. thought I'd warm you, warm you up with a couple of charts and graphs about, uh, about the myths here. Very first myths, the very first myth that we're going to bust is the millennials are fleeing from the city of Vancouver. There's lots and lots of, of media headlines around this. And, and oh. Oh, that was one too many. Let's back up one second here, guys. Myth one. Lots of media around this. One second. There we go. Don't hit it. Millennials are giving up on the city of Vancouver. Are people fleeing Vancouver? Census suggests the exit trends are becoming a stampede out of the city of Vancouver. Really, really interesting on that side. It's, I just have all these pictures of young, young millennials herding out of, the, out of the city of Vancouver. So population by age from the city of Vancouver. So age across the bottom. If we look at what the distribution from the census was, you can see there it is by age group. This is what the population in the city looks like to a demographer. Uh, largest age group in the city, 25 to 25 year olds. 63,475 individuals of that age. Okay, So in terms of looking at whether they're stampeding out or flowing in or whatever, we need to take a historical period. That millennial generation was aged, aged 11 to 30 in 2016. There's where they sat. And if we look at the history, there's what they look like or the population looked like when we were back five years earlier in 2011. Okay. Two cardinal rules to demography that are really important for what I'm going to try and explain. The first one is that just about everybody gets older every year. It's just about because some people die. And, bear with me on this one, you can't be born a 15-year-old. Okay? 
Just keep those in mind. I know I hear something like, what the hell is that guy talking about? But nonetheless. So there's a couple of ways to, we, to look at this change. So we can look at what a demographer would call an age group change. And that's looking at that 20 to 24 year old age group. In 2011, there was 44,285. And then by 2016, 44,150. So we saw a decline. It's by no means a stampede, a stampede of 135 folks going out, but hey, you know what, it's, I don't write the headlines. Um, so this is one way of looking at it, and it does reflect a little bit of a decline with regard to that particular age group. Uh, if I look at the 15 to 19, similar as well. So another way to look at this, it was called a cohort approach. And this is where we step back five years and recognize the stock of people who were five years younger, five years earlier in that profile. Again, this is why, one, you can't be born a 15 to 19 year old in this sense, but then also just about everybody gets older every year and they progress from one five-year age group into the next five-year age group. So if we look at that and we go back five years to the 15 to 19 year old age group, 29,095 kids, by 2016, they had become 44,150. So the implication there is 15,055 more millennials uh, aged into that particular group or moved into the lower mainland or the city of Vancouver, sorry, uh, over that five-year period, which represents about a 50% growth in just that age group. So a stampede out? No, not really, I wouldn't say. We can do this for all age groups, and this is what I would call a, a net migration or a cohort profile for the city of Vancouver. There's what it looks like on the small side. I'm just gonna adjust the axis for you guys here so it looks a little bit more representative. And there's a couple of interesting stages here. We look at this one, the 10 to 34 stage, all net gain for the city of Vancouver, okay? Uh, if we look at the 35 plusers, that's where we see a net loss. So if there's anybody stampeding out of the city of Vancouver, it's not the millennials, it's the tail end of Gen X. It's the 35 year olds, okay? Now, the next question is, are they heading out because, oh, and you know what, one other quick thing, we have to remember that out at the end, there's some deaths that happen out there where mortality rates get high, and that's in part why it goes down. So the next question is for that 35 to 39 year old, which is the largest outflow for an age group, are they being pushed out by high housing prices? Is that the case? Well, uh, in order to get to that assessment, we can look back historically and say, well, has this changed historically over time? And if I look going all the way back to 1991, well, that pattern is almost exactly the same for every five-year census period going back to 1991. And I just didn't put the previous census periods on it, but it reflects back previous to that census period as well. So the question is, like, what is driving this pattern then? It's the composition of the housing stock in the city of Vancouver. It's predominantly rental, 53%. Predominantly in apartments, 60%. And if I put in that illegal basement suite, or what I used to have to call my drywall collection in the basement, 80% um, in those forms of housing. So the process here is that young kids come because that's the dwelling stock that they can get into. Do you think they stay in West Van? Where can you rent a basement suite in West Vancouver? It doesn't happen. So. There are regions within, the, or cities within this region that do see an outflow of that millennial generation. Here's one, the loss between the uh, 19 and, uh, and 30 population. Does anybody want to hazard a guess where this particular geography is? Bueller, no, hey, nice, I heard of West Van. No, I, but you know what? There's this even worse. I should have used them. No, this is actually the city of Port Coquitlam. It's exactly the same for Coquitlam and a lot of the other municipalities. So what the heck is going on here? Historically, very, very strong, similar pattern. Well, the net loss, it's kids getting out of mom and dad's house, right? You want them to go, get them out. Yes, so they leave mom and dad's house in the burbs, and where do they go? City of Vancouver, myth busted. Why is this important? There's the profile for Canada in 2018 and 37.2 million folks in Canada. If we take uh, this on a sort of a generational ba basis, there's the baby boomers, 9.4 million. There's me, the Gen Xers, 9.9 .9 million. I'm the new baby boom actually because there's more of me in terms of that Gen X now than what the post-World War II boomers are. And there's the millennials, age 13 to 32 in 2018. Does anybody want to hazard a guess at how many millennials there are in there? Okay, I'll make it easy. Uh, bigger and smaller than the baby boom. <clears throat> bigger and smaller than Gen X. Smaller. Ha, 9.5 million. Slightly bigger than the post-World War II boom. 
almost as big as, as, a, as Gen X. Now, our models show that within about the next five years, Canada-wide, because of immigration, uh, that millennial generation will actually be larger in absolute number than what Gen X is. So, fundamentally important to understand these processes of some of that, those generational changes. And this one as well, the proportion of kids still at home, 20 to 24 year olds, 61% of them are still at home Canada-wide. 25 to 29 year olds, more than a quarter of them still living in the family home. Does anybody have 20 to 29 year olds at home? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, I see some hands. I got some shitty news for you. 30 to 39 year olds, 10% of them are still at home. <laughs> you guys are hooped, hooped. 58% of millennials were still at home in 2016. 6% of Gen X were still at home, living in the parental home. So if I do that math, the next decade is going to see more than 3.8 million millennials and another 531,000 Gen Xers at least contemplate moving out of mom and dad's home. The implications here on the housing side, really, really significant. I'll double back to this a little bit towards the end as well. So in terms of that myth, it's been busted. The millennials are not fleeing the city of Vancouver. We're swimming in millennials, to tell you the truth. Uh, and and in, in terms of why this matters to you guys, the city of Vancouver has and always will have an influx of that under 35s due to the composition of its dwelling stock. Uh, and the flip side is the suburbs of the region, at least to the degree that the, the kids are still at home, will always have that outflow of that under 35s as, as mom and dad do try and get the kids out of the house. Uh, and then understanding this process, because the scale of that millennial generation that, that is going to move through the age profile is really, really fundamental as they are now entering that household formation stage of the life cycle. Okay, the second myth that I wanted to bust for you guys this morning was this don't have, notion of don't have a million. So this hit the media like a barnstormer again. And uh, Vancouver housing, the least second affordable in the world. Now, I'm not going to talk about affordability per se, but I just want to get to this, uh, the don't have a million side of things. If I take 2018 residential, total residential sales and I line them all up, there's what they look like. There was 42,047 of them in 2018. Top sale, $33.9 million. Uh, would have loved to have been the broker on that sale, yes. Uh, but if I look at how many fell at under that million dollars, there's the million dollar mark. There was 31,215 sales. That's about 75% percent of the sales uh, were under a million dollars within the lower main, mainland region in 2018. Average was $903,000. A better estimate probably is the median in, in, in terms of value is about 685. But how we tend to look at this is to split it up into quartiles or to quintiles and look at these buckets to see uh, what that means. If I look at, if I take the top 20% off and say that, you know what, like that's, the vast majority of people aren't playing within that, that particular realm of, uh, of the housing uh, stock, and I look at the bottom 80%, the average is about $629,000, which looks a lot more reasonable relative to an average sale price of $903,000. So... That one is kind of interesting in and of itself. The don't have a million, well, you don't actually need a million to get in. Uh, yes, certainly in terms of 74% of the sales fell below the million mark. In the city of Vancouver, it's a different situation. 61% in the city fell below that million mark in 2018. The big yes here is that, yes, okay, uh, only 0.9% of detached in the city of Vancouver fell below that. And I know that that's what the hashtag was about. But all of that said, 43% of detached sales region-wide still fell below that 1 million mark in, uh, in 2018. So it paints a little bit of a different picture. It doesn't necessarily talk about affordability per se, but on the affordability front, I'm just going to throw this out there and say we need to do a way better job at one, defining what affordability is and the metrics that we use to track it. And I'm going to plea with you guys here, please, 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 can we stop comparing average and median incomes to average and median sales prices? You saw that the average sale price was $903,000. Uh, is that what people are buying? Well, your first time home buyers, people entering the market, they don't typically go out, I hate to tell you this, they don't typically go out and buy the average house. They also don't have average incomes. They're on the lower side of things. They're first time home buyers. Um, I walked around the tables and I saw a couple of the TD is here and a couple of the other banks. RBC's not here, uh, which is great because I can make fun of them. That's the RBC index is, is basically what they do. Uh, we need to stop doing that and get a better handle on, on affordability, okay? 
Third myth that I wanted to bust, we've been adding more than enough supply to accommodate demand. Now this came out of uh, Professor uh, Dr. Rose from Kwantlen and Polytech. Construction has supplied more than enough homes for local households. All right, so here we go. Housing starts and completion. So I go back to CMHC for this. There's the, the starts that we saw all the way back to 1990. 2016, they peaked out at just over 30,000. This is for what I call the lower mainland region. We're gonna go from Squamish and we're gonna loop all the way around and include the valley as well. Uh, if I look at the pattern of completions, uh, there's the completions. They peaked out in 2018 at about 27,000. One of the really neat things about starts and completions database is the vast majority of starts become a completion only a couple of years later. So like you can use it to forecast stuff out, which is really, really neat. What's lose or what's missing in this conversation is this, demolitions. So while we peaked out at 30,000 starts, we also peaked out at the number of demolitions in 2016 as well. We had to demolish for more than 4,000 units in order to build the 30,000 units or start the 30,000 units that we saw in that year. So I've been cobbling this together for, uh, since, uh, since January. I've, I've managed to get a historical database now that goes all the way back to 1990 in terms of demolitions. And if I look at that as a rate, what on average, right now it's 15%. On average, going back to 90, it's about 14%. So one in seven housing starts is associated with a demolition. We got to knock something down to actually build it. Uh, but we get planners and all kinds of people within the industry out talking about this notion of, oh, we have had a record number of starts. Yes, you have, but you have to compensate for the number of demolitions on that as well. Just for fun, I threw in the municipal distribution of this. This is the five, last five-year average in, in terms of the rates. Uh, and if we look at somewhere like West Vancouver, 50% demolition rate in West Van. Wow, ouch. Yeah, you get build two units, you got to knock down one. Uh, City of Vancouver, it's about 16% in terms of its stock as well. So something else, another element that hasn't traditionally formed into part of our conversation that we're all going to have to start to increasingly look at, especially in the older municipalities where it is an aging dwelling stock and we're getting a lot of conversion as well. So housing changed 1991 to 2018. Have we been adding enough supply? Well, there's population additions uh, through the census, 868,000. There's what the number of occupied homes did over that same period, uh, 35, or 355,000. Over that pe same period, we saw almost 400,000 completions. So on the top side, mm, thumbs up, right? Dr. Rose is spot on. But if I adjust for demolitions, we've got to knock out 56,000 on that, which means that net completions of about uh, 345,000 and uh, a net loss or a shortfall of almost 10,000 units on that side. So, okay, you know, uh, it it's should be, in all fairness, a, a relative balance on that. What I haven't netted the net completions down for on that is the city of Vancouver vacancy or any kind of vacancy rate as well. So, nonetheless, let's just work with that on that side. I'm going to flip over to an economic theory. Jean-Baptiste Say. Say's law is actually a really fascinating one. Say said supply creates its own demand, and yet aggregate production necessarily precedes an equal quantity of aggregate demand. All that really means is that if you don't build it, nobody can buy it, right? So housing, very similar. If you don't build it, well, they can't live in it. But the interesting thing about housing is that people still orient themselves differently over time. So Prominence of living with mom and dad, it increases. Uh, something like, well, you know, I'm gonna live with uh, six individuals uh, and I'm gonna bunk in with everybody. This is actually reflected, uh, Say's Law here, in uh, what I would call the life cycle of housing occupancy. Uh, in 2016, 45% of people in the Lower Mainland were primary uh, household maintainers. They primarily responsible for the finances of the house. If I look back to 1996, it was 46%. So about a 2% decline in the prominence of people who were primary household maintainers or the household formation. But if I look at this on an age group basis, where the big, big change was, was in these younger age groups, that millennial generation, people first entering the home buying or the home occupancy stage of the life cycle. So if I take that pattern and I say, well, what would happen, what would have happened uh, since 1996 if I get rid of that Say's Law and that pushing down of household formation rates? If I go back to this picture, rather than the 355,000 occupied housing, if we had occupied everybody in the same way that we had in 1996, we should have had 
There we go, 414,000 occupied homes. Relative to net completions, they wouldn't have changed, 345,000. That's a shortfall of almost 70,000 units. So from my perspective, I'm going to bust that one as, a, as another myth as well. Uh, outside of that, traditional economics said that if we have been adding uh, more supply than what was demanded, we should have seen downward pressure on prices. That certainly didn't characterize the market as well. And, but we do need to acknowledge that uh, we do need to build an adequate supply of housing to accommodate the needs of both a growing and, uh, and a changing population. And here's another one that I'm just sort of going to throw out. Most importantly, we need to stop pitting the demand siders against the supply siders uh, and recognize that uh, we need to work to modify both curves. Supply, that was an economics joke. You get it? Supply, demand, curves, move, equal, always price, no? Ryan's laughing. Nobody else is. It's okay. I knew it would fall flat because it's an economics joke. Right? Okay. So those are the three myths that I wanted to bust. It's stuff that's in the media uh, before I went on to the formal part of the presentation. So let's move on to that. As I say, I've only got 24 minutes to get through all of this stuff. Whoa, too many stories, ram low. Unemployment reaches a 40-year low with 94,000 new jobs created in November. So the economy with up to this point in time has just been howling. If I look at growth in gross domestic product in 2017, Canada grew by about 3%. BC, we sat above that 3.8%. Alberta, they were climbing out of a recession, so they grew really well just because it was a small base because of the, their recession. Really robust times in terms of growth. Bank of Canada, as a result of this, as the economy grows, inflation comes up, and the Bank of Canada comes up and says, ah, well, we're going to increase what they call their target overnight lending rate, which is supposed to have downward pressure or suppressing impact on economic growth, and most importantly, on inflation, which they want to target in about that 2% range, uh, which just came out the other day, and they're in and around uh, yesterday, and then I think it's 1.8, 1.9%, so not a lot of pressure, just insiders here, not a lot of pressure next week for the Bank of Canada to raise rates. You heard it from me first. Uh, since that early time in 2017, we saw five increases to the target overnight lending rate from the Bank of Canada, up to about 1.75%. There's what it looks like. There's the five increases. Why is this important to our industry? Well, over that period, those five rate increases of 0.25%, when combined with the changes to the mortgage lending rules, have increased two percentage points to your, uh, to your negotiated rate, what that meant was that over that period of time that resulted in about a 20 or 25, between a 20 and 25% reduction in that household spending power, just because of these policy changes that we've had both from the Bank of Canada as well as the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, that's the 2% the on that side of things. When we came through October of 2018, which is, you know, like was five, six months ago, this is what the quote in the news was. So with the overnight current at 1.5, the consensus is that we're going to see more rate increase, or we'll see one more rate increase from the Bank of Canada through 2018 and one to three through 2019. All of the big banks nailed the overnight lending rate for the end of the year at 1.75%, and we've been at that point. But this notion of one to, more, one to three more increases through 2019 has changed really, really significantly and very, very quickly as well. Here's the headlines now. Expecting higher rates in 2019? Well, don't bet on it just yet. The outlook has changed so quickly that now a move in the opposite direction is becoming a real possibility, and that could be a rate cut. I want to go back to 2017 to explain this a little bit as well. So there's 2017, there's 2018, a little bit lower. 2.1% is what the expectation was from the Bank of Canada and the consensus from the big banks. There's what it looked like their expectation for 2019. As part of their uh, policy uh, doc in January, the Bank of Canada also Pulled, ooh, connection, also pulled their uh, expectation back for uh, GDP slightly, back to 1.7% for GDP in, in 2019. So definitely, the economy has been growing, but the bank has made it clear that there are certainly some headwinds and they're gonna be really, really cautious in terms of how, and how they're going forward and what they're gonna do. One of the things that they said that they're keeping an eye on is certainly the retail spending. Re retail spending is down by about 2% since its peak uh, Canada-wide, but that is on the heels of about a 35% growth since uh, the big recession in, uh, in 2009-2008. 
BC, uh, down as well as the lower mainland, down by a little bit more, 5 and 6% in terms of consumer spending, but we were up more. Uh, we were spending more on a per capita basis, 41% of BC up 50% as well. So really, really strong growth. I would have expected it to come off a little bit as well, but this is one of the things that the Bank of Canada is watching in terms of, uh, of going forward. Employment growth is another one, not that it's declining, but it's growing more slowly is what the bank's line is, 1.6% in terms of the monthly data. This is the most recent monthly data. Previous year, it was about 1.8% relative to the one6 for the previous 12 months. So yes, certainly a notion of uh, slowing growth on the job side of things. But in part, that's because we're looking at a historically low unemployment rate. Uh, nationally, our unemployment rate sat at 5.7%, lowest it's ever been. So in, in some senses, the economy or jobs can only grow so quickly because we can only capture so many people out of unemployment and or migrate people in through, uh, through immigration. If we look at an Canada, not Canada, but British Columbia, we actually fared a little bit better. We saw about 2.4% growth, and this was on the heels of relatively gr good growth uh, in previous years, 2.3%, and then the average of about one7 But we're in exactly the same spot on the unemployment side, a little bit lower, 4.5% uh, on that side. Oh, man, I have to apologize. My clicker's doing some crazy things on me up here. Employment growth in the lower mainland, we did really, really well down here, 2.4%. The most recent one was a little bit slower, but if I look back to last year, we saw almost a 5.3% growth in our employment down here. So barn busting job growth down here, so a little bit of retrenchment on that side uh, in the most recent 12 months on, on the number of jobs. But again, in part, this is going to be driven by a relatively low unemployment rate, 4.9%. Victoria is the crazy one, 3.2% unemployment rate in, uh, in Victoria currently. So very, very challenged on their ability to grow uh, their job base because it's in large part going to be uh, a result of bringing labor force migrants in. Median weekly earnings. This is one that caused me a little bit of concern as I was putting the data together. 1.7%, this is something that the Bank of Canada looked at as well, slowing our earnings growth. 1.7 versus 3% last year and about 2.2% on average. The most recent data, which was February, actually for BC saw a decline. So a little bit of a concern here. All of that said, if I look back to the previous year, we saw four, almost a 5% growth in, uh, in earnings uh, over the previous 12 months last year. So some really, really strong growth. It was a lot in scientific and technical occupations where there is higher income. So I'm hoping that as we roll forward in the coming months, we'll actually see that, uh, that number in terms of the decline in median wages uh, go to a small increase as well. So why all this matters to you guys? Since the Great Recession in 2009, we've really experienced one of the most robust periods of economic expansion in Canadian history. But uh, we have some headwinds of change coming. Uh, slower consumer spending, normalizing of housing markets, slowing job growth, the depressed energy sector, international trade wars, Political tensions, China and Canada, this Huawei, uh, now BC, Alberta, Jason Kenney threatening to turn the taps off, some challenges federally, and then some challenges municipally as well as we get new councils in and, and sort of them ha having to figure stuff out. And then on the international side of things like Brexit and the whole crazy landscape of things that are going on internationally on the political side as well. Politics, uh, I kind of watch it like a car accident. I can't help but stare at it as I sort of drive by. Um, I love it and I hate it, but uh, on the housing policy front, I thought I would just say this. Uh, policy decision interest rates slowed real estate market and they're needed for a, a rebound. Uh, a slowdown was the intended response to regulatory changes and must not be seen as a sign of market weakness in and of itself. So just kind of a good quote on the policy front of things. We all know what they are on the negative side of things. We've been talking about them lots. On the positive positive side of things, we certainly have the national housing strategy and then most recently as part of budget uh, 2019, this shared equity loan as well. Uh, if you get onto our Intel page, we've got a little brief there in terms of some of the data for that shared equity loan. Uh, there's more questions out there with regard to it than answers right now. So uh, as we get that, if you sign up for our, our mailing list, as we get stuff, we'll send it out to you on that side as well. 
So there's sort of the economics and political landscape. Uh, move on quickly here to demographics, demand, and supply. I'm going to go back up to the national level here. 20, end of 2017, the federal government came out and said they wanted to achieve 340,000 immigrants a year by 2020. A year later, last fall, they came out and said, well, by 2021, we want to hit 350. We're going to up that. Uh, and then this is now, these policy changes are now being reflected in the data. Citizenship and Immigration Canada reported their fastest quarter of immigration as far as uh, uh, people coming in for the last quarter of, uh, of 2018. This was reflected in Canada's population growth. We saw the fastest quarter of population growth Canada-wide and certainly in British Columbia as well where we cracked the 5 million mark. Good for you guys. Uh, but it was all on the heels of international migration, and a good portion of that inter international migration that we saw in that quarter, at least, was a uh, change in non-permanent residents, so students and people coming in on work visas as well. So because we're relatively nimble at, uh, um, on the modeling side, we're able to model this stuff. But what I wanted to show you guys before I get to the implications for here in the Lower Mainland was why the federal government is doing this. And this is what we call the coming demographic crunch. 1971, there was about 6.6 .6 people in Canada of working age per senior citizen. 2018, that number had fallen down. That was a joke, get it? Falling down, senior? Mm -mm. It was tasteless, I know, I know, I, but I just had to say it. it down to about 3.6. And if I go back to StatsCan's old projections, their projections were that it would fall further down to about only 2.3 people of working age per senior citizen by 2036. So with regard to the, our pay-as-you-go healthcare system and our Canada Pension Plan, there's some real, real challenges here. Uh, not to mention growing our labor force, uh, consumer spending, and all of the other things. So this is why uh, the federal government is changing their immigration policy. If you're young, you should be really, really happy that the federal government is doing this because it's going to share the tax load over many more shoulders than just yours. And if you're old, you should also be really, really happy that the federal government is doing this because there's going to be a stock of people to pay for your hip replacements and there's going to be a stock of labor force to actually work within a lot of the, the industries that, uh, that you're going to grow and see and use in the coming years. Okay, so here's what it looks like on the immigration side. On average of about 274, 275,000 immigrants to Canada per year in the past decade, that's what BC shares look like, share looks like. We get about 15% on average, about 40,000. But the important point here is that's what the lower mainland share looks like. We get about 90% of BC's immigrants. So any changes at the federal level disproportionately impact us down here in the lower mainland. So what does it look like on the, st on the stat side of things? Well, there's our forecast, 39,834 uh, net immigrants. Our forecasts are, given the changes federally, that's going to go up to about 45,000 and then slowly taper off to about 39. Natural increase, that's the difference between births and deaths falling down to about 870, negative 870, that's the point at which there'll be more deaths than births uh, in the Lower Mainland. Uh, again, an aging population. In terms of interprovincial migration, we expect it to go back to historical averages in the range of about four to 5,000. And then intraprovincial, that's people moving around in the province, uh, increasing up to uh, just over 8,000 by the end of the projection period. This is uh, the equity refugees, we call them, at the office. Somebody who may have gotten into the market, oh, in let's say Dunbar maybe 20 or 30 years ago and spent you know maybe $500,000 and now their home is worth eh, like you know two or three million dollars they've got lots of options and they may flee out to other uh, amenity rich regions within the province of British Columbia. There's what it looks like in terms of total population today 2.9. Uh, some of us uh, aging in deaths I can model this the deaths would, about 700,000 deaths going forward. Uh, so, you know, uh, the sort of the half empty side, eh, lots of deaths, not so good. Uh, the half full side of things, that means like almost 80% of us are still going to be kicking around by 2041. <laughs> Thumbs up on that side. Yes, some of us would find out uh, or figure out how to procreate. Uh, 2.9 million, still not enough to compensate for the deaths, nonetheless. And here's what it looks like, about 1.1 million more folks in our population by 2041. So... Uh, that's a big number, and as a point of comparison, over the past 23 years, we added about 868,000 as well. So uh, it is a period going forward where we may experience more growth on the population side and way more change as a result of our changing demography than we've experienced historically. All right. So 
Housing, what are the housing implications of that? Well, I'm going to go back to what I call a primary household maintainer rate or this life cycle of housing occupancy on an age-specific side. And it's this life cycle pattern that we can apply to the population by age to get out these household formation rates, to get out what the number of dwelling units would be required to house the population as we track people through these major life cycle or lifestyle changes from family formation to family rearing to empty nests, and then eventually as the maintainer rates at the end fall off, that's when people typically go from being a primary household maintainer in private accommodation to either living with their kids, sandwich generation, or into things like collective and institutional dwelling, seniors accommodation. So again, it's applying this to the population that we can step back and say, okay, housing demand for 1.1 million more residents in the region, 35% growth, would actually, we'd need almost 480,000 net new dwelling units to, uh, to house them, which is about a 42% growth. We actually do this on a structure and a tenure type basis as well. Uh, apartments gonna grow a little bit more rapidly, about 43%, ground oriented a little bit more slowly, but given people's pension towards being close to the ground, this is changing and we do model this, but there's still a strong predominance towards ground-oriented, a little bit larger on the absolute side, about 282,000 ground-oriented. Now, I just threw this one in for fun. I ran our economic model as well. In addition to 500, almost 500,000 new dwelling units, we're also going to have to accommodate almost 550,000 new jobs. You want to talk about competing land uses? Ooh, Really, really interesting. So as a point of context here, for all of those, we're going to need to add another, mm, like a city of Vancouver plus Burnaby plus New West plus Richmond to this region by 2041 to accommodate both the people as well as the jobs that are going to come along with them. So some pretty significant challenges moving forward on that side. Some Also some very significant opportunities going forward too. Metro RGS, I was asked to talk about this. I'm only going to touch on it briefly. The Metro RGS, they're just in the process of doing their public consultations right now. The Metro RGS has a little bit uh, more rapid population growth than what we do, 39%, recognizing that I lo I'm looking at a larger region than what Metro does, because I, again, I go from Squamish all the way around to uh, the valley. But they've pulled back on their housing forecast. And the implication here is that after like three decades of slowly declining number of persons per dwelling unit, that the number of, of people per dwelling unit is going to start to grow in the coming years. So I sent a, a, a note to the guys at Metro, and Terry Hoff sent me a, a really nice long email back to say that we're in the consultation stages of this right now, and I'd really, really love to hear what you have to say with regard to where we're going for this. So, so you guys know I'm going to get involved in this and uh, report back to you guys in terms of, of what we find as they go uh, further into that, uh, that RGS process. I'm going to double back to supply and demand as well. Back to my starts and completions. Housing starts, CMHC, I know Eric's here as well, so they, they actually do a forecast in moving forward of what uh, starts are going to be. There's what their starts are going from that peak of 30,000 down to about 19,000 in 2021, uh, coming off very, very significantly from the peak. If I look at what demolitions are, I'm going to adjust those starts downwards, and I'm going to take StatsCan's for, or CMHC's forecast for the next two years and adjust them downwards as well, that's the 14% on average, to get what I'm calling net housing starts or net new housing that's available for occupancy for folks. That's what it looks like. And like I said, the really cool thing about starts is you can use them to forecast what completions are. So we do this, we do it on a structure type basis as well uh, and, and work it through. Here's what net new homes looks like. So this is basically historically CMHC completions and then in moving forward modeling those starts through. So our forecast is that it's going to go from about 24,000, 25,000 down to about 17,000 by 2021, 2022. So the big question is how does that chalk up against my outlook for population and housing demand? There you go. There's housing occupancy historically, and you can see in terms of looking forward, if I put my projected demand on there, within the next two years, we're actually going to be back in a situation where the supply of units coming online is actually going to exceed what I would see being demand. So a bit of a challenge there. There's some economic implications on that side, um, but an interesting, interesting picture nonetheless to look at. So. The next decade is going to see an average of almost 23,000 new homes annually needed to accommodate population growth and change. It's not just about immigrants, it's about my kids eventually getting out of the house as well. But back to this notion of starts, given demolitions, that means starts would have to be in the range of about 25,000 starts a year within the region. We currently fall well below that as well, so some interesting times on that side as well. Why this matters to you guys? Well, ooh, let 
come back up, sorry. If it, uh oh, is right, yes. Here we go. One, two, three. One more time. So why this matters to you guys, again, with regard to this notion of a relatively constrained market on the supply side, uh, we're going to have to see the supply of new hom homes coming online increase from what the expectation is from, from CMHC in terms of the starts. And, and, you know, in the short term, on the economic front, this has the potential to certainly lead to upward pressure on housing prices again, uh, but it could also serve to further constrain those household formations rates, which both certainly will probably happen uh, if that pattern of supply and, and demand uh, comes out the way that, uh, that we expect it to as well. Quickly, I'm going to talk about the squeezed generation. So Paul, Paul Kershaw, I don't know if he's in the audience. Uh, Paul actually started, I think he trademarked this, Generation Squeeze, so I didn't want to put Generation Squeeze up there for trademark infringement, but nonetheless, I lo uh, love Paul and we have fascinating conversations about data all the time. So all of that said, despite declining household formation rates, which I've already showed you guys, especially in those younger segments of, uh, of the life cycle, why was the market so busy over the past decade? Well, if I take that and I look at the 30 to 39 year old age cohort change over time, 1976 to 1986, 99,000 people growth in the lower mainland in that 20 to 39 age cohort. 1986, it exploded. 222,000 people moved into that age cohort. What's going on, Ramlo? Well, that's when the post-World War II boom. Not the leading edge, but the big bulk of the, of the tail edge aged into that particular age group. 1986 to 2006, 127,000. Much slower growth. Why? Gen Xers, a lot fewer of us. The leading edge, the boom started to age out into the next age group, right? 2006 to 16, on the way up again. Millennial generation. The kids, the, boo, the kids of the boomers, leading edge aging, aging into that age group uh, between 2006 and 2016. Where are we going? It's going to continue to increase as the rest of that millennial generation ages into that age group, the rest of the millennial generation in Canada, plus that's the age group where we do typically see a lot of immigration as well. So uh, also is that stage of the life cycle where people are forming households, right? So some pretty significant implications here. So if I focus back on that young millennial generation, and I just take that under 45 population, kind of like I did historically when I started out in terms of busting the myth, and we say, okay, well, what would happen if we were able to get family for household formation rates back to where they were in 1996? What would happen on that side of things? Well, it, it's actually really interesting, because if I look at that, if we continue to squeeze household formation, what our model actually shows, we would need about 100,000 net new dwelling units in the next decade to accommodate just that generation as they entered the housing formation stage of the life cycle. That said, if we flip it around and if we extended the same housing opportunities to the generation who are going to enter the housing market that were given to the generation previously that entered the housing market uh, and those maintainer rates or those household formation rates came up, we would actually need to add another 50,000 units to this region to accommodate them. So that's like adding like about six river districts just to get that millennial generation back to the same housing circumstance or situation that the previous generation experienced uh, when they came through and formed households of their own. Uh, really, really interesting. In aggregate, about 150,000 dwelling units. Now, had some other statistics come across my desk early th this week. Uh, I just got a big tabulation from StatsCan, which tracks uh, the average number of people per dwelling unit and the average number of bedrooms per dwelling unit. Ironically, in the city, uh, in the lower mainland, so sorry, Vancouver CMA, there's about 154,265 single detached homes that actually have more bedrooms in them than they physically have people living in them. So it's about the same number. Really, really interesting. So while I think some of the conversations are certainly going to, going forward, revolve around affordability and availability, I think efficiency is going to be a new one. We've got to think about a better word for it. Um, watch our website for this. I want to write a little bit of a paper on this. How can we induce that post-World War II boom generation who is in the midst of empty nester stage of the life cycle, who are chronically overhoused, uh, how can we induce them out of their single detached homes increasingly? So that one, maybe a new family uh, can move into that or potentially be redeveloped into 
two units. So watch for that as well. Uh, this stuff is really, really interesting. i leaving off with this because I think there's a lot of further research that I personally would like to do and I think a lot of you guys would love to do that as, or see that as well. But that's what we would need to do to solve the millennial generation in terms of moving forward between 100 and 150,000 net new units in the next decade added to this region. So, thank you so so much. I'm going to finish off with this. Visit intelligence.rennie.com. That's our new landing page. Thanks to Daryl and the guys. Just as a recap, the Rennie Review, that's our monthly MLS publication. The Rennie Advance, that's just a quick one that we get out. We try and beat the board on that, always. Uh, the Rennie Outlook, that's our uh, long-term population and housing outlook. The Landscape is our economic overview. We certainly have a whole bunch of briefing papers and, uh, and some white papers on there as well, and I hope to expand those, hopefully with some of your involvement uh, in the coming months. So thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, I think for everyone in the room would have found that pretty interesting. Um, for myself, I think uh, everything Andrew spoke about uh, is coming from London, as you might be able to tell from the accent. Um, I think you're going to be facing a lot of similar challenges. Uh, as Andrew said, you probably want to come up with a better word than maybe efficiency or what the UK went with, which was the bedroom tax, which proved very unpopular. Um, but that issue of uh, the older generation having homes with extra rooms, there's a lot of issues in the UK, um, very similar, and I think Vancouver will hopefully have a better uh, approach to it than the UK has so far. Um, just wanted to, to thank uh, Andrew and, and Rennie for today. Um, really, really interesting, and I know that from the people I speak to uh, within the, the development world, that there's a lot of people that would have liked to have been here today, um, and that's testament to the event and, and testament to the UDI as well, um, that this event sells out and, and that there's more people that would like to, to attend. Um, just like to also thank our, our co-sponsors, uh, Chris and, and Rise Alliance. Um, happy to have them as, as clients of ours at Impact Recruitment. Um, and uh, yeah, Impact Recruitment as ourselves, we're, we're proud to be part of this industry. Um, we're, we're proud to support the companies here uh, and work with uh, some of the people in the room today. Um, hopefully you all enjoyed the cookies that were on the, the tables. Um, we've spent months and months of eating around and we've picked what we think is the best cookie in Vancouver. Um, the other one to thank is uh, the team at the UDI, um, John, Anne, uh, Yvonne, and, and the whole team there for, for putting on events like today. Um, they're very informative, um, very good networking events, and uh, it's, a, it's a credit to the industry that we're in. Um, just a little reminder, the next luncheon will be on the 16th of May. Um, you have Samuel Asifa, I believe, um, who is the director of Seattle's Office of Planning and Community Development. A bit of a mouthful, but uh, that's the next one. And then the following month as well is with uh, Mayor Kennedy Stewart. So that should be an interesting event as well, I'm sure. Um, finally, at Impact Recruitment, we're looking forward to seeing a few of the people in this room, hopefully at the golf events that we'll be co-sponsoring uh, in May. Um, and uh, yeah, just finally, thank you all for coming. Thank you.